USS Ward started life as almost literally one of many, part of the Wicks class of destroyers, which were one of the most numerous of that type of warship ever built. At the time she took shape on a Mare Island slipway, about the only remarkable thing about her was that she physically didn't exist halfway through May 1918, but by the start of June her hull was in the water and by the end of July she was merrily steaming about the Pacific ready to fight. But whilst World War I still had several months to run, Ward was not destined to see any action in that conflict. Instead, she was made flagship of Destroyer Division 18 and sent at the end of the year to take part in fleet exercises in the Caribbean. Remaining on the Atlantic seaboard, she was chained, along with the USS Boggs and USS Palmer, as a dual-purpose, heavily armoured navigational beacon and possible lifeboat for a trio of Curtis flying boats, NC-1, 3 and 4, which were attempting a transatlantic flight via the Azores. Ward's life-saving services weren't required at that stage of events, although two of the flying boats wouldn't actually make it all the way, but they came down close enough to their destination and all crews were rescued, which happened to include one Mark Mitcher, which was probably just as well for the World War II US Navy. She then rejoined the fleet on its great migration through the Panama Canal back to the Pacific, where she visited various ports and took part in a fleet review before receiving a hull designation, DD-139 just in time to be decommissioned along with a large portion of the US Navy's destroyer fleet in 1921, taking up a berth amongst various sister ships in San Diego Harbour. Here she would spend the next two decades, not falling into the category of so poorly built that she was scrapped, nor quite so top of the line that she was pulled back into commission. She was, however, considered in better than average condition, and so was not allocated to the destroyers for bases deal with the UK, instead being brought back into US Navy service on the 15th of January 1941, assigned to destroy Division 80, which was itself assigned to guard the channel entrance to the US Pacific Fleet's new home at Pearl Harbor. As tensions escalated throughout the year, Admiral Kimmel ordered Ward and the other patrolling ships to depth charge any submarine contacts they came across. US subs approaching the harbour should have been on the surface, and so an underwater approach this close in would almost certainly be hostile. Early in the morning of the 6th of December 1941, Ward headed out for her assigned weekend of patrolling. Almost 24 hours later, the USS Condor reported a suspected submarine contact, and the ship went to general quarters hours before the sun began to rise. Nothing was found, the crew began to relax. Then, two and a half hours later, the USS Antares reported something odd was trailing her, which meant Ward's crew were rushing to general quarters once again. They then noticed a small object creating a wake immediately astern of the supply ship. Her new commanding officer, Lieutenant Outerbridge, was not even 72 hours into his job, and he now sent the ship bearing down on the contact in the unlikely combination of pyjama trousers, a kimono, a life jacket, and a World War I infantry helmet. The forward gun opened fire, which was the first hostile action by a US vessel in what was about to become the Pacific campaign of World War II, uh, but it missed. The destroyer then sped past, and one of the aft guns managed to score a hit, which was followed up by forward depth charges, finishing off what would eventually turn out to be a Japanese midget submarine. As the Ward's message began a labyrinthine journey through what was still peacetime US Navy communications networks, the ship searched for other contacts, attacking one, but without any result, before heading back for Pearl Harbor itself, arriving just in time to witness the spectacle of the Japanese Navy's first wave wreaking havoc ahead of them. Ward remained on sub-hunting duty for a good part of 1942 until more and more modern destroyers as well as dedicated sub-hunting escorts began to come online. Then she was sent to Bremerton for conversion into a fast troop transport, hull classification APD-16. This was the fate of many of her class. The reef it caused her to lose some speed as the forward machinery spaces were converted into troop compartments, and her guns were entirely replaced by 3-inch and 20mm Orlicans for anti-aircraft work. Thus refitted, she headed for the front lines in early 1943, where she alternated between her new role and also serving as an anti-aircraft and anti-submarine warfare escort. Over the next two years, this pattern would continue, 
Although, again, as more and newer ships came online, the anti-submarine warfare role largely went away and she alternated between landing troops and serving as an anti-aircraft escort for the troop convoys that she was part of. And as time went on, even the anti-aircraft mission began to diminish beyond the realm of general self-defence. Eventually, this found her taking part in the invasion of the Philippines in and around Leyte Gulf. Loaded with troops, she began to offload them on December 7th, 1944, three years after those first shots at Pearl Harbor. Once empty, she took up an anti-aircraft screening position and Japanese aircraft appeared. Ward began a familiar pattern of evasion manoeuvres and anti-aircraft fire, but this campaign would see the start of the kamikaze effort something neither she nor the U.S. Navy in general was really ready for. Within minutes, the nearby USS Mahan had been hit, and nearby U.S. Army Air Force fighters strove to keep the embattled destroyer alive by fending off additional attacks. Unfortunately, this left Ward exposed to attack from a trio of Betty bombers. Now, to her credit, Ward managed to down all three, but one of the bombers managed to crash into the ship at the waterline and explode, dealing the ward fatal damage. Her crew fought to save the ship, but unfortunately much of their damage control equipment had been stored amidships and had gone up with the aircraft. The fuel supply for the portable pumps combining with the aviation fuel from the bomber to create an inferno that the remaining surviving pumps simply couldn't put out. After almost 30 minutes of rearguard action against the flames, including assistance from a number of nearby ships, amongst which was the USS O'Brien DD-725, which was now under the command of Lieutenant Commander Outerbridge, the same officer who had helmed Ward at Pearl Harbor, uh, the vessel was ordered abandoned, remarkably with only one man injured. O'Brien thus hauled off to sink this stricken vessel with gunfire, and the ship sank at 11.30 in the morning. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.